Brother JD right there, amen. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm kidding. That was an honor that Pastor J.D. would allow me to be uh, to be here. Amen. I just appreciate it so very, 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 very much. Amen. We've got some friends with us. Uh, also, the, the, the Beavers are with us. Amen. Mike and Sue, very good friends of ours. We just met them a few weeks ago. Uh, we got some ties with West Virginia, and they're good folks, and they live here. They're just good people. We just appreciate them for being here, and it's just good to see so many of you guys that we grown to love over the over the years, we count you as very, very, very close, very, very close friends. Amen. Moxley Ministries is is doing uh, a lot more since the last time I, I seen you guys. We God's really been opening doors and just really been uh, showing us more about what it, what this evangelical ministry uh, really is. Amen. I, Barna put out a statistic not long ago. I said the average church across the board in the United States of America, we average winning one new soul per church in our whole in our whole nation. Talking about Church of God Baptist, all of them, we average winning one person per church to the Lord. How many of you know that's unacceptable? Can somebody help me? You went 365 days and only one person uh, got saved. That really burdened me because I I began to pray, God, what what do we need to do? What do we need to change? And and then I noticed something in in my ministry. I noticed that I went a whole year and only seen 79 people saved, and I was and I preached like 280 nights that uh, that year, and, and only seen seven. My, my goal had always been as a pastor to win 100 people to the Lord every year, and I done that for 25 25 years. But here I was evangelizing, preaching what three, four, five times as much, and and only only seen 70 something people saved, and it burdened me so bad that I nearly quit. I nearly quit being, um, nearly quit evangelizing. Evangelizing and said, no, I don't need to do this because I'm not winning winning souls. I went away and y'all ever heard of a guy named Carl Richardson? How many of y'all ever heard of Carl Richardson? He's one of the, he's the Billy Graham to the Church of God. I went and spent two days with him. I said, I tell, talk to me. I need to know because all he ever done was evangelize. And I, I said, I really need to know what, what to do here because we're not seeing souls saved. And he looked at me and said, well, sinners ain't coming to church. <laughs> you know, so I uh, mean, you're preaching to people that are, that are saved. He said, do you ever get to preach to young people. I said, absolutely not. The Church of God, we protect our young people from the Holy Ghost. Amen. Uh, when they're born, we snatch them out of their mama's hands and put them in a nursery till they're three. And then we put them in a children's church building uh, cabins out of popsicle sticks till they're 12. Then we put them in a youth group eating pizza till they're 18. And then we get mad because 95% of them quit going to church when they go to college just because they ain't never been. Can somebody help me? Amen. And so so he said, well, well, 87% of the people that get Save, get saved before the age of 13. Wow. And so, so you're losing a 87% chance if you're not preaching to young people. So that being said, we, we cranked up and started having a children's service uh, on Wednesday night before sure, at 6 o'clock. We, we put chickens to sleep and resurrect them. Amen. It, it's a power. If we don't resurrect them, then we have a chicken dumpling dinner to get the pastor back home. Amen. Amen. But, but we, 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 we just done, started doing stuff like that. The school superintendent of a, of a school had three suicides, called me the other day and said, hey, would you come back to the school and do an assembly? I called my good friend Reggie Dabbs, and he and I went and preached and ministered to 2,500 students in a in a school. Now other schools are starting to call and ask if we would do the same thing. I noticed sinners ain't coming to church, so not only are we reaching, trying to reach the young people, I went and rented, some of you folks will know this, this name because you hunt in Illinois, I went and rented the auditorium in Benton, Illinois, September 11th, 12th, and 13th. It'll set about 12, 1,400 people. Uh, we rented that. I've, I went and catered a meal with a bunch of pastors, and I'm trying to get them, all the churches, to bring their lost loved ones for a soul winning crusade uh, in those three in those three nights. And we're going to pack that place out. So we're doing we're doing things to win souls. Can somebody help me? Last year we had th last year we had 359 people give their life to Jesus Christ. Can somebody give God a hand clap of praise right there? Amen. 
And, and this year I've asked God, this year I've asked God, God, I at least want 365 this year. Let us be a New Testament evangelist where you add to the church every day, such as should be saved. Amen. If you want to know more about what Moxley Ministries is doing, there's a newsletter back there. Get it. But that product table back there helps us do all that stuff. I said all that to say this. That product table really helps us. Those t-shirts Debbie makes and those CDs that she tells me what to preach. I preach it and she makes copies of it back there. Amen. And that really helps us go to go to different uh, places. There's one t-shirt back there. I told the church this morning I was at. I was riding down the road. I was heading to, I was, I was heading to West Virginia. Petersburg, West Virginia. Mil, uh, uh, Moorefield in Petersburg, West Virginia. I done a 12 day meeting there. 42 people got saved. 51 filled with the Holy Ghost in that 12 day meeting. Somebody ought to give God a praise there. Amen. But the uh, but but I was riding down the road there and and the Lord just spoke to me and I I I I, I don't know I kind of got anybody ever ride down the road and be listening to some good gospel music and get cocky anybody ever do that well, I just had a cocky moment there and I just I just shouted out tell hell I ain't coming amen and and so so it kind of rung a bell with me so I called Debbie immediately I said make me a T-shirt and put on it tell hell I'm not coming amen amen and and I, I went and I, I said that at the church. I was heading to in Moorefield, and they ordered 52 shirts with tell hell, I'm not coming. Amen. So we got some of them back there. So if you're not going to hell, buy one. Now, if you're going to hell, don't buy one. Amen. Amen. But if you're, if you're not going to hell, pick you up one. It'll help you. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. I want to talk to you tonight about something as I travel around, and I talk more plain to you guys because I, I just feel like, I feel like I, I'm just a part of you guys, really. I mean, I really and truly do. I don't say that no Nowhere else in the in the 14 states we go to do I say that because I don't feel that way in the 14 states that I that I go to. But when I come here, time I walk in, immediately people start talking about you know, so crazy stuff like turkey hunting, bear hunting, and deer hunting. Amen. And man, we just I just enjoy being around being around you guys. I count these families as uh, the Hudson family as my family. I really and truly do. But as I travel around these United States, I'm finding something out. Church attendance is at an all time low. Fox News said the other day. That church membership is the lowest it's ever been in our in our nation. Barna said the fastest declining institution in the United States of America is the church. And, and I, I begin to pray, okay, God, why? Why is why is that being uh, the Generation Z? They call them. Uh, that's the how old are you, sweetheart? I can't remember how old you are. You're 21. I keep thinking you're 16. Amen. Amen. Y'all got to have me more often. People are growing up around here. Amen. Amen. But 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 hear me. Hear me. Her, just under her generation, she's 21. Generation Z is those, what year were you born in? What year were you born in? 97. It is her generation. Generation Z is those people born in the mid 90s to the present time. Only 4% of that generation has a biblical view of the United States, uh, the biblical view of the world. Only 4%. 33% uh, of that generation does not identify themselves as being heterosexual. They they believe that gender is something you decide when you get when you get older. Y'all, we've got to have revival. Can somebody help me? Amen. But why is it that people aren't coming to church? What is it? And I think, I, 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 and there's a lot of things, there's a lot of people smarter than I am trying to figure it all out, but there's one word that really just, God just spoke to me the other day about reason people aren't coming to church. The reason people ain't praying, the reason people ain't reading their word is because of expectation. They don't expect anything to happen when they come to church. They don't expect anything to happen when they pray. They don't expect anything to happen when they give. They don't expect it. So what I'm praying tonight, what happens is, God, help our expectation. Help us when we walk in that door back there. We're expecting something to happen. It's just not a Sunday night service that, that we're coming along to sing a song and hear a sermon. No, let us expect. The reason this these pews right here are empty, these chairs right here are empty, is because people didn't expect anything to happen, so they didn't come sit. If they were expecting God to show up, they would have been here. Am I making sense? Amen. 
If you'd have had Willie Nelson here tonight, they wouldn't be a place to park because they'd be expecting to hear Whiskey River take my mind. Amen. But, but here tonight, they're not filling the places up because they're not expecting God to do. I'm going to expect God to heal this precious lady right here. Let's start expecting God to heal Mitchell, this young man you told me about. Let's start expecting God to do miracles around the altar one more time. Am I making sense to anybody? And it's got to start with us according to, I, well, let's just read the scripture before I get too excited. Look in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. You know the scripture. If you'll stand with me, we'll read it. Amen. Look at what he says. Now faith, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. My faith, faith requires my expectation. Yes, it does. That's what, it, if it's the evidence of things I'm hoping for, if I hope for something, I'm expecting it. Amen. If it's the evidence of things not seen, if I know the evidence, then I, I'm expecting. Amen. I'm expecting, amen, something to be there to leave that evidence. Look at this next scripture, Psalm, Psalm 62, verse 5. He said, My soul waits thou up only upon God, for my expectation is from him. So my faith requires expectation. And if I want him to increase my faith, I got to pray to the God that I trust to increase my expectation. Wow. I like this scripture in Philippians chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Look what it says. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by my life or by my death. He goes on and says in verse 21, for me to live is Christ and for me to die is gain. How can somebody be bold enough to say that? It's because they had earnest expectation. God increase our expectation. Are you still on the building with me? Amen. Will you pray with me? Father, I love you and God I'm asking you one more time tonight to take this hunk of dirt and God just use me to preach your gospel. You said, how can they hear without a preacher? How can he preach lest he be sent? I praise you, God, that I've been sent here. And I'm asking you, Lord, to use me as a vessel in your hand, a paintbrush you would paint a painting with, a scaffold you would perform surgery with, a hammer you would drive a nail with, a saw you would cut out a timber with. God, I want to be used in the master's hand tonight to deliver this word. And when all things are said and done, God, let us give you glory and honor for all that's going to happen in this building tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Before you sit down, turn to your neighbor, look him dead in the eye, and say, you're the prettiest thing I've seen all day long. Amen. You may be seated if you <laughs> if you can. Again, thank you, Pastor, for allowing me to allowing me to come. Amen. Could it be? Could it be? Jesus, so many times in the in the in the scriptures, he would prove himself of who, being who he was by performing a miracle. He would come up and say, "So that men will know I have power to forgive sins." He'd say to the sick of the palsy, "Take up your bed and walk." We're not seeing miracles anymore around our altars. I, I dare say, I dare say that that most of the miracles that we hear about and talk about are mostly in our past, and we're not seeing God move. He said, "If you believe in me, you'll cast out devils." How many believe there's still devils to cast out? Amen. Uh, my goodness, again, I said this this morning at the other church, but but I had a guy tell me the other day. He said, "Well, we don't cast out devils now because there's not any devils to cast out." I said, "Man, you're a crazy and a run over dog." Amen. Amen. Because you look, for somebody to rape a youngin, they got a devil. For somebody to put dynamite in their underwear and run into a crowd, they got a they got a devil. Can somebody help me? Amen. For somebody to for a man to lust after a hairy leg, he's got a devil. Can somebody help me? Amen. For a woman to lust after another woman, she's got a devil. She's got she's got a devil. Am I making sense here? Amen. We've got a lot of people with devils, but we try to pass it off as well. They're just got they're just like that. We got to send them to a therapist. No, we need to start casting out devils one more time because he said those that believe shall cast 
out. Why don't we cast out devils? Because we don't expect the devils to leave whenever we command them to get out in the name of Jesus Christ. Y'all, his name ain't lost an ounce of his power. It's still just as powerful as it was the day he was born in that man. His name is Jesus. And it's by the name we're saved. It's by that name we're healed. It's by that name that devils have to flee. I need at least five people to act church of God tonight and give him a shout. Can somebody help me if you're still believing in the name of Jesus Christ? Could it be? Could it be that the reason we're not seeing miracles is we don't expect them to happen? I've noticed something. I've only been a Christian 29 years. That's a lot to some. It ain't long uh, to others. But but hear me, 29 years, and I've seen it trans transition. It used to be if somebody was sick, they come to church to get people to pray for them. Now if they're sick, they stay home, and the whole family has to stay home and bring them soup. Can somebody help me? Amen. And so we're changing. We're not. Why, why is that so? Could it be because we're not expecting? anything to happen when we get here and we don't want others to catch what we got so we stay at home and, and uh, no he said is any sick among you let them, go, let them call for the elders of the church let them lay hands on them and anoint them with all if they've committed any sins it shall be forgiven and they shall be lifted up God I pray one more time that we expect people when they lay hands on us and proclaim it in the word of God that it's going to happen because of his power and our our expectation. Now, I never like to preach a message if I don't back it up with a story in the Word of God. If you can give me a little more monitor here, I would appreciate it because I need to hear this message back. Amen, amen. So let's look with me in the book of Acts chapter 3. The book of Acts chapter 3. I'm going to read 10 verses of Scripture there, and we're going to talk about expectation. And we're going to see how this man that we're going to talk about tonight, we're going to see how his expectation transformed, and he started expecting something totally different from when he started out. And my prayer is tonight, I don't just preach to, to hear myself preach. I certainly don't preach because I'm getting rich. Can somebody help me? Amen. I certainly don't preach. I do get to, I get to, get to deer hunt a lot since I've been, I've been, I've been uh, evangelizing. God knows we're going to need to meet. Can somebody help me? Amen. But but what am I saying? What am I saying? I, I don't, I don't want to just preach tonight because it's a time to, to fill in a gap. I want God to transition some of us in this field. I want him to transition me because so many times I get busy being busy that I forget who I'm depending on to do what I do. That's right. That's right. I hope that made sense. So look with me in the book of Acts chapter 3 verse 1 through 10. Now Peter and John, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour of the day, about 3 o'clock in the evening. And a certain man lame from his mama's womb. Now we know that man, we know he was above 40 years old. Now we don't know what that means. Later on in the next chapter it talks about that man and it said he was above 40 years old. He could have been 78. That's above 40. We don't really know. We just know he was above 40 years old. I like that because now I'm 57. But people start, when people, I'm going to get where I get to when people say, how old are you? I'm going to say, I'm above 40 years old. Amen. It just sounds better. Amen. It just, my wife tells everybody when they ask, how old are you, Sister Debbie? I'm 29.95 plus shipping and handling. Amen. 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 But, but he was above 40. So we know he was at least 41 because that's above 40 years old. And he had laid at this gate since he was 40. Uh, for 41 years, he had laid there. He said, whom they laid every day every day daily at the gate of the temple which is called beautiful to ask alms of them that entered in to the temple. Wow. Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple ask an alms and Peter fastening oh my God. Peter fastening his eyes upon him. Now we don't do that no more. Matter of fact when we see that guy standing by the red light holding up a sign we try not to make eye contact with him. Amen. Because we'll have to put a dollar in his bucket. Amen. Come on now. Yeah. But they fastened his eyes upon and said, Look on us. Uh oh. Look on us. I know a lot of Christians don't need to say that because they ain't living good enough for the world to look at them. Well, I hate to preach on sanctification, but I need to preach her just a dab. You don't want the world to look at you if you're saying you are and you ain't. 
You don't say, you don't say look on us if you got one, if you got a Marlboro hanging out your lips. You don't want to say, come look at us if you got a big old chaw on your jaw. You don't want to say, come look at us if you're hanging out at the bar with the, with, with the, with the boys. You don't want to say, look at us if you, if you will a woman and it ain't your wife. Are you still with me? And we got all this stuff that people say, well, because of grace, thank God I've got grace and I'm still going to heaven because I can do. We have cheapened grace so much, y'all, that we don't believe that a man went all the way to a cross called Calvary and let him beat him till he was unrecognizable and let him jab spears in his side, nails in his hand and his feet to pay for it. We cheapen it up. That way you can just get away with anything now and still... He said, look on us. He gave heed to them expecting. He was expecting to receive something of them. Peter and Peter said, then Peter said, silver and gold have I none. Pastor J. Dan, I preached that wrong for years. I preached about two broke preachers, Peter and John. They just didn't have no money. But, but that, ain't, that can't be true because Peter and John were Jews and Jews law. They were raised from babies up. You didn't go to church without an offering. So we know they had some gold in their pocket. We know they did because it was wrong for them to go to church without an offering. So they weren't talking about we're broke and don't have nothing to give you. What they were saying is the silver and gold in my pocket. That ain't what you need. That ain't what I'm here to get. I'm ready to take you to another dimension. You're expecting, you're expecting me uh, to drop a little change in your bucket, but I got something way bigger than that little change I can put in your bucket. He said, in other words, he's saying, I'm about to change your expectation. Oh God, somebody ought to give him a praise right there. He said, but such as I have, I give unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Well, y'all, the church has lost its power. The preachers have lost their power. The laity has lost their power. That may be true or not, but there's a name that's above all other names. He ain't lost an ounce of his power. And I don't come to you tonight in the name of J.D. Hudson. I don't come to you tonight in the name of Tim Hill. I don't come to you tonight in the name of Billy Graham. I don't even come to you tonight in the name of George Moxley, I come to you tonight in the name of the name that's above all other names that at the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Wow. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand. I've been preaching a lot lately. Naturally, I'm an evangelist. I have to preach a lot. Somebody said, I ain't seen your truck home much. I said, you seen my truck at home. I ain't eating that week. Somebody help me. Amen. So I preach a lot. But hear me. Watch this now. As I'm studying the Word and getting messages from God, Brother J.D., it's amazing to me how many times the right, that word right is used. The word, I preached a message this morning. The river flowed from the right side of the altar. Take and throw your net on the right side of the boat. He took him by the right hand. I, I was really struggling with that the other day because I was studying where he said, cast your net on the right side of the boat. And it, 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 something hit me between the eyes. Whose right was he talking about? Jesus is on the bank looking at the boat. Hold up your right hand. Somebody hold out your right hand. That's your right hand. If, if, if I'm on the boat looking at you, this is my right hand. Right. And he said, throw the boat on the right side. And I said, now, now are you talking about your right? Or are you talking about my right? If I'm going to throw it out on your right, I got to throw it out on this side of the boat. If I throw it out on my right, I got to throw it out on this side of the boat. Now, whose right are we talking about? Are you with me? And I got to studying that and I got to praying. Now, God, I need to know where to throw the net. Do I throw it on your right or my right? Or do, if your right will be my left, my right will be your left. Which is it, right? or left. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I ain't talking about right or left. I'm talking about right or wrong. Can somebody help me? Amen. If we... Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's right. 
He took him by the right hand. That means he didn't take him by the wrong hand. Amen. In other words, we got to start living right, y'all. We got to quit pushing the envelope, seeing what we can get away with. Oh, somebody said the other day, well, the old church used to see miracles and, and the old church used to do this and the old. Listen, all those things that our old church, the old church used to live by, it wasn't because they didn't want to wear makeup. It wasn't because they didn't want to wear jewelry. It wasn't because they didn't want to wear britches. It wasn't because they didn't want, no. They thought if they was anything that would hinder their presence, their, their relationship with God, they wanted it pushed away. Are you still with me? All right, they went a little overboard with it. I don't think there's nothing wrong with you putting an ear bob on. Or put, it's amazing to me all the rules we made. Uh, women, you can't wear makeup. Women, you can't wear jewelry. Women, you can't wear britches. All the rules were about women. Are you with me? You know why? Because men met and made them up. Yeah. But hear me, it wasn't, it wasn't that, it wasn't that they were trying to make a bunch of dogmatic rules for us. No, they were trying to say if it would offend God. One of our earliest assemblies with A.J. Thomason, somebody asked a question, is it wrong to chew gum? And A.J. Thomason answered it, said, well, we're going to make no rule about it, but if it hinders your worship, you ought not. And what he's trying to say is anything that keeps you away from God, don't do it. But now this is what I'm hearing as an event. Angeles. I travel all over this nation. I go to 14 different states now. And this is what I'm hearing. Inevitably, there'll be somebody that'll pull me. Won't deny it because I'm saying this, but inevitably, there'll be somebody that'll pull me over to the side because they don't want to ask their pastor because they know I'm leaving. And they'll ask me some question like, is it, is it really wrong? Can you go to, I, this is the truth. Can you go to heaven chewing tobacco? I said, I don't know where you're going to spit. <laughs> okay, I probably shouldn't have said that. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Is it wrong? Show me in the Bible. Is there a scripture in the Bible about smoking? Is there a scripture in the Bible about smoking? I said, the only one I can find is Rebecca lit off her camel. That's the only one I can find in the whole book. Amen. Amen. Can, can you wear, is it really wrong? I, I had a lady, this is the truth. I'm not making this stuff up. I had a lady ask me, is it really wrong for me to wear a string bikini to the beach? I looked at her and I said, I don't know. Would you wear your underwear through Walmart? She said, well, of course not. I said, well, the same people go to the beach, go to Walmart, and a bikini ain't nothing but high dollar underwear. Can somebody help me? Amen. What am I saying? I ain't saying that to pick on nobody. I'm saying that for this reason. Now we look to see what we can get away with and still make it to heaven instead of what can we do without and get closer to God. Am I making sense in this building? I say, God, if we're going to build our expectation... If we're going to build our expectation, I'm not up here preaching against stuff trying to hope I find something that somebody's doing. No. I said this again. I say this everywhere I go. How do you know if something's right or wrong? If you can't praise God while you're eating it, don't eat it. If you can't praise God while you're smoking it, put it out. If you can't praise God while you're chewing it, spit it out. If you can't praise God while you're saying it, shut up. If you can't praise God while you're watching it, turn it off. If you can't praise God while you're dating her, leave her at the house. If you can't praise God while you're dating him. Don't go around him. If you can't praise him around that group, stay away from that group because he said, bless the Lord, all my soul and all that swift and me bless his holy name. Wow. And he took him by the right hand, not the wrong one, the right hand, and lifted him up. And immediately, his feet and his ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple. Look what he said, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people, all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was him that laid, it, that, laid for, that, laid, that sat for arms at the beautiful gate of the temple and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Tonight, I want to talk to you about four different things as we see the transition of this expectation changing. The first thing I want to show you is this man had found himself in a routine. Remember, he had been laying all of his life. He didn't know what it meant to walk. He never knew what it meant to walk to a deer stand. He never knew what it meant to run and catch a ball. He never knew what it meant to go wade out in the pond. He never knew that. He had always been lame. And because he had always been lame, he built his normal around his nasty. 
there's too many of us, and God help me for what I'm about to say. There's too many of us, we build our normal around our, our nasty. What do you mean? When I pastored Unity, one of the things we done, the battered women's shelter called me and said, Brother Moxley, we need a building. But the government won't give us a grant to build a building. They'll only give us a grant to rent a building. Would you build the building, Unity Church of God on it, and let us rent it from you? All day long. How many do you want? Amen. I mean, that's pretty good doings. If I'm going to build it and you're going to pay for it and it's still going to be mine, yeah, throw me in that briar patch. Amen. And so I built the battered women's shelter. The Unity Church of God owns the battered women's shelter in Jessup, Georgia. Well, because of that, they, I had some ties with them. And, and, and they would get me to talk to the different, if some of the women down there wanted to talk to a pastor, they would just send them up the road to the church and they would come sit and talk with me. And it was amazing to me. It was amazing to me how many women, I'm talking about beat, I'm talking about their jaws would be broke. They'd come in with their arms all casted up on crutches and in wheelchairs. They'd just be beating the tar, some man be beating the tar out of them. And I talked to them and after a little while they'd go right back into that relationship. Because they just, they just thought it was a normal thing. And they made their nasty normal. I wonder so many times have we made the nasty of the church the normal. Well, you can't go. I hear this all the time. You can't grow a church in this society. We've made the nasty the normal. Well, it's impossible to reach that generation uh, of, of Generation Z. We've made the nasty the normal. Am I making sense? Yes. Now, now, I, I, a lot of those ladies, if I could ever get them to change the way they seem and break their routine, they could come out of that. I, am I making sense? And, and now, listen, I, I probably shouldn't say what I'm about to say, but I'm amongst family. There's a couple of things that, that, that I have struck, I struggle counseling people about. If they molest or hurt a child or if they beat up a woman, I struggle with counseling those people. And, and one day this lady got her husband to come down there. And I looked at him and I said, what makes you? beat on your wife. He said, I don't know. Something just comes all over me and I have to hit her. I said, I'm going to make a deal with you. Here's my cell number. Next time that spirit comes on you and you got to hit somebody, call me. I'll come stand in for her. I think about two licks, I can wean you from sucking eggs. Can somebody help me? Amen. <laughs> I mean, I'll have to let you hit this one, then I'll have to let you hit that one, because I got to turn the other cheek. But after that, there ain't no further instructions. I can wean you from beating up on women, I guarantee you. If every time you hit her, I hit you, you'll quit hitting her directly, amen. Guess what, he never hit her again, amen, amen. But hear me, you got to break that routine. You got to break that normal. God help me for what I'm about to say. Somebody put an article on the excellent ministry of the church of God and talked about how the church is need to be small because small churches do more. No, 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 no. That's We making that normal. We making that nasty normal. God, he added to the church every day such as should be saved. God, help us to never settle for little. God, help us never to settle for our fall and no more. There's a harvest of 80% of this county that don't know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Let's don't let the normal be their nasty, be our normal. He built a routine around it. You know what a routine is? A routine is what you build around something you think you can't change. And here he was in a routine. Every day for above 40 years, we don't know exactly, but we know for above 40 years, he, he was brought to church and laid in the same place every single day for above 40 for above 40 years. I need a young man. Where's a young man at in here? Give me a, give me a young man. I seen a young man with a coat on back. Come on down here, brother. Come on down. You a Hudson. Amen. Come on. I could have picked you down here, but I, let's bring him in here. Amen. Come up here. Come up here. Come up here, my friend. Come up here on this platform with me, if you don't mind. Just lay down right here. Just lay down right here. If you don't mind, just lay down right there. Amen. You got on blue polka dotted shirts. We just look, we look just alike. Amen. Praise God. We're kin, you know. Amen. Lay down. 
<laughs> right there. Now you got to remember, he was laying at the gate called Beautiful. Now this is where a lot of people don't understand. Now don't lay, lay on your side like you're asking for alms. There you go. Lay on your side. Just lay here. Lay on your shoulder. There you go. There you go. He, he's laid at that gate every day for 40 years. A lot of people don't realize that, but the gate he was laid at was the church that Jesus attended. So for 33 and a half of those 40 years, 40 above years, Jesus was either brought or walked right past him. Well, I've been to church and they said Jesus was there and I didn't get healed. Jesus walked by this man every Sabbath. He walked right by him. Well, when he was a little baby, they carried him by him. But still, he went right by him. For four, I don't say, I don't have Bible to prove this, but I would almost guarantee you Jesus throwed some money in his cup every now and then because he might have needed something to eat and Jesus knew about it. But he was never healed for f above 40 years. He made a routine out of coming and laying at this gate called Beautiful. He had made a routine, no doubt. It didn't matter what he wore, to what he wore this day because this day was just like yesterday. And yesterday's just like tomorrow. It's going to be the same thing every time. It's going to be the same thing. It don't matter if I comb my hair. It don't matter if I shave. It don't even matter if I take a bath because I'm going to end up at the same place tomorrow where I was today. It really don't matter if I go to church. They're going to see three songs. The preacher's going to preach for 42 minutes and make sure we're all beating the Baptist down at the buffet. Amen. And so we're okay. So why should I keep coming? coming uh, to church. Am I making sense? Why should I keep praying? I've been praying. Ain't nothing ever happened in our routine. We're not changing. If you can look at this man, I almost guarantee you, if you can look in this man's eyes, uh, you would see that the light in his eyes have went out. Now, now, now what I'm about to say kind of just helped me just a second. Not long, last deer season, last deer season, I, I had a preacher friend of mine that had a heart attack and he called me and said, Brother Moxley, I need some deer meat. I need some deer meat bad. Not only do I need it financially, I like deer meat. And can you kill me a deer? Well, sure. So I went and climbed the tree and down there where we hunt, it's real thick in South Georgia. I was only home for a week or so. And there was a deer come out right at dark, really too dark to shoot it. But I said, well, I'm going to shoot it anyway. That boy needs that deer. And, and so I ended up in shot and somehow or another I, 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 I didn't hit him good. And I don't never lose a deer, but the deer ran. And I had to go get my, my brother-in-law's dog to try to trail the deer up. And that dog, and my brother-in-law's a big guy. He's built like a, he's built like Bigfoot. And I mean, he'll, he could twist me in two. And the last thing my brother-in-law looked at me and said, my brother-in-law's name's Gut. If you got a brother-in-law named Gut, you might be a redneck. Can somebody help me? Amen. But Gut looked at me and said, now, now, now preacher, I, I'm telling you, if you lose that dog, you're going to be in trouble. Well, I ain't going to lose that dog. So I had that dog by the leash, and he drug me through woods. He drug me through swamp. When I got to the other side, I'd lost my glasses. Wow. And so I had to go to the doctor for them to give me an exam. And when I was in there, the, the lady done all the things she'd done to my eyes. And she looked at me. She said, you're pretty healthy. I said, what do you mean? She said, I can tell how healthy you are by your eyes. I said, what are you talking about? She said, I can look in your eyes and tell what kind of diseases you got in your body. Because the light, the eyes are the window of the soul. And no doubt, this guy had lost the light in his eyes. He wasn't looking for nothing no better. He's in a routine. Now let me stop and explain myself for just a second. We had two drug rehabs there at Unity Church of God. And, and, and whenever a drug addict would come in my office, if I could ever get the light back in his eyes or her eyes, we could get them off drugs. If I couldn't, they would leave. They would come drug addicts and leave drug addicts. But if I ever got them, what that twinkle come back in their eye where they knew I ain't got to be this way. I ain't got to live this way. If I could ever change the look in their eyes I could see them change their life. No doubt the light in this man's eyes had went down. He had come. He had watched all these people go in and come out. Some of them would throw coins in his cup but not him. He couldn't go but so far. Remember he was laid at a gate. A gate is a place of access. Are you with me? He's that close to going in, but he never gets to go in. He's laying right there by the gate, but he never gets to go in. That gate, they say, is built out of, some, some say it's made out of brass, some say it's made out of gold. Either one is a reflective material, so he's facing, he don't face the gate, because if he's facing the gate, he sees himself in this condition. So he's laying there with his back to the gate, because he's got to face the people as they're coming up the road, so he 
can throw a cup. He don't want to look at himself. He don't want to see the day. He don't want to see the mess that he's in. He don't want to see, because it's the same thing. It was the same thing yesterday. It'll be the same thing tomorrow. It was the same thing 27 years ago, and it's going to be the same thing 23 years from now. He don't want to see himself. He's in a routine. Oh, God, help the church that we break the routine, that we break out of this routine and not let our nasty be the normal. And we're expecting something bigger than just what we had yesterday. If you stay here, if you stay here too long, if you stay there too long, you'll start to believe in that it's just not for you to go any further than this. You'll just start believing and you'll start making excuses. Well, I'm this way because of the color of my skin. I'm this way because, well, daddy was a cripple, now I'm a cripple, and my children will be cripples, and daddy was a drunk, so I ain't got no hope I'm going to be a drunk. You'll start making, well, if I had education, I wouldn't be here. If I'd have been born on the other side of the tracks, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here. If mama hadn't had me out of wedlock, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't, and we start making excuses while we're laying at the gate, and we quit expecting anything different. When we lose, when we don't think we deserve any better, when we don't think we deserve more, I ain't talking about more money or more trucks or more houses. I'm talking about more God. I'm talking about more healings. I'm talking about more deliverances, more self. When we get to where we don't think, then we automatically we're whooped. Because the Bible tells me, look what he says in the book of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 through verse 21. Look at this. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened when might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, and the height. Amen. The depth and the height. And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that he might be filled with all the the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we expect. All that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. What's that power that works in us? Our expectation. He can do more than I ask him to do. We just ask him to heal Sister Joanne, right? Is it Joanne? We just ask him to heal Joanne. He can do more than that. More than what we think. I think he can heal Joanne. So he can do more than that. Y'all, I think he parted the Red Sea. I think he closed the lion's mouth. I think he showed up with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the middle of a fire. I think he rose Lazarus from the dead. I think he rained down manna from the sky. I think he saved my soul. I think he resurrected from the dead. I think he's on the right hand of the Father making intercession for me. I think there's a heaven made out of all where the streets are gold and the walls are jasper and the gates are pearl. If he can do more than I think, all according to the power that works inside of me. So if I get to the place where I don't expect it anymore, I'll never, I'll never receive it. If you lay there too long, you'll start thinking, well, that's just the way it is. We used to be a we used to be a wide open full church, but we'll never be that way again. And you won't, because according to the way man thinks in his heart, so is he. I know you've heard this little illustration. I heard it, and it makes me laugh every time I think about it. And I don't know why I just thought about it, but I heard about back in the Revolutionary War there was a there was a, a platoon of fighters, and they were broke. Had no money, had no money to buy bullets, had no money to buy guns. But they were out fighting the British, fighting the battles. And here they are, and the, the, their commander told them, says, we're just going to have to operate by faith. He said, when you see them coming, the enemy coming, I want you to just say, bang, bang. And we're just going to believe they'll fall. If something happens and they get too close, I want you to pretend you got a bayonet on the end of your stick, stick. And they'll fall. 
Boy, the soldiers were hyped up. They took off. Here they are fighting the battle. Here come some shoulders. Bang, bang. Boom. They fell over dead as a hammer. Wow. One of them got past and come close. Got a stick, stick. He grabbed his gut and fell over and died right there. Now all of a sudden they got kind of cocky. They got to looking up. Here come this big fella. They said, watch him. I'll get him. Bang, bang. He just kept coming. He kept, bang, bang. He kept coming. Got closer. Stick, stick. Just run over him. Stomped him dead. And they heard him while he was stomping him. He was saying, tank, tank, tank. Amen. I don't know if that's true or not. Amen. But I will tell you this. Hang with me now. Hang with me now, Hudson. I will tell you this. If you think it. Now, I ain't, them, I ain't one of them new age movement people. But I know your mind, your mind, your expectation can change things. That's been proven. That's been proven. Let me just give you a quick example. I, I jumped up whenever me and Debbie were young and married. Well, we're still young. She is. I'm kind of old. But I'm above 40. Amen. Amen. But, but whenever we first got married, I bought a little farm that had no house on it. And I, 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 I tore that old house down, and I took them old fat lighter timbers out of it and built me a, a shelter, a tractor shelter. And I let the ends run wild till I put my tin on. Then I went back with a saw and cut them all off and fell. They had nails that long in them. And I was up there, and I jumped off the ladder, and one of them nails poked all the way through my foot. Well, I'm supposed to be tough because I was raised tough. There's a thin line between tough and stupid, but I was tough. And so I just, I, I'm going to keep on working. And I went and pulled my sock off and put another sock on, kept on working. That night I went to walk to the house and, uh-oh, my legs are hurting. I get up there and take a shower and Debbie got looking at it. There's a red streak running up my leg. We better get you to the doctor. I go up there to the doctor and the doctor says, son, we may have to take your leg off. Oh, no, 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 uh-uh, uh-uh, I'm too young for that. We got to do whatever it takes. We got to keep that leg. I don't need no job at IHOP. Can somebody help me? Amen. I got to keep that leg. And so, so they started pumping me full of antibiotics. I'm laying there and all of a sudden I'm hurting so bad. I'm hurting so bad that every time my heart would beat, I thought my leg was going to fall off. Anybody ever hurt like that? And so I called the nurse, mash that button. I said, said, the nurse, can I help you? Yes, ma'am. I got to have something for pain. I'm hurting so bad I can't breathe. No more than I let that button go, Brother Strickland. This woman walks in, this nurse. She had a pill in a little cup, one of them little old ketchup cups. And walked up there and says, here you go. And I took that pill. It wasn't three minutes. I'm laying there. Debbie's standing by my side. I'm laying there. Oh, whoa. I'm shaking. My, oh, all the pain's gone, Debbie. I ain't never, this right here is the reason people get on drugs. I ain't never had nothing make me feel this good in all my life. This is the best pill. This is it right here. I'm going to get another one directly. All my pain's gone. By the time I said that, I'm drifting off to sleep. I'm passing out. A nurse walks, another nurse walks in with a shot. She said, I said, ma'am, what's that shot? She said, you called for something for pain? I said, no, man, they done gave me a pill, and boy, it's working. She said, that was just an antibiotic, buddy. Amen. That ain't got nothing to do with the pain. You know what happened? Immediately, my foot started back hurting. Amen. And I wouldn't look at Debbie because she was about to die. Amen. Amen. What am I saying? I thought it was working, and it worked. Am I making sense? What would happen if we here tonight would say, I'm coming to that altar in a minute, and I'm expecting God to do what nobody else in this world can do. I'm expecting him to do what doctors and lawyers and oh my God if you stay too long if you stay too long in this routine if you stay too long at the gate and don't go in you'll start getting mad at other people that do go in look at them they think there's something Dennis McGuire, a good friend of me and yours, he said the hardest thing to be in the church of God is successful. If your church starts growing, everybody's church that ain't growing wants to talk about you. Because they're laying at the gate and they'll talk about others that are going in through the access of the gate. Am I making sense? There was two guys in my church that yet, when we first started, started Unity Church of God, I had an evangelist come. And he called for people. He was up there praying and, and or up there preaching, and he stopped. And he said, this man's vision, pointed at me, he said, this man's vision is bigger than the finances of this church. He said, we just started a storefront. 
He said there's two men that God wants to raise up to be multimillionaires that'll give to this church and support this vision. I want them two men to come right now. Two men jumped up and ran down there. He prayed for them. Boom, they both fell out in the spirit. I went, wow, that's pretty good if it's real. That's what I said. <laughs> if that's real, that's pretty good. Well, both of them got up. In six months, they were both multimillionaires and paid tithes, still pay tithe today to any church of God. Wow. I ain't one of them. You know why? Because I was sitting back here saying, well, if that's real, it's pretty good. I wasn't expecting it. Can somebody help me? Amen. If I'd have expected it, I might have been giving y'all all an offering tonight to let me preach. Amen. Amen. But hear me. Those two guys was raised up immediately. Man, boom, boom, boom. Everything they touched started turning to gold. And they became multimillionaires. And I heard people in the community, oh, how's that man got that much money? He must be selling drugs. People talked about them like they were some kind of dog. Are you with me? And all they did was come down and let God bless them. What am I saying? If you don't go in and you lay there long enough, you'll start talking about other people that go in. But I want to declare something tonight, and there ain't nobody in this building I don't love. Amen? But hear me. I'm going to go in. If you want to talk about me, talk about me. But I'm going to go in. I want everything God's got from me. I don't want to leave an ounce of it. So hey, if it causes you to be mad, just get over it, because I'm I'm going to go in and I want to see the God that I'm living. Oh my God, I wish I did. Now watch this. I'm almost through preaching. He had a routine. It's just hang with me. You don't mind hanging with me, do you? You don't mind hanging. He said, no, this is comfortable. Amen, amen. He had a routine. And all religion done, all religion done was support his routine. People was coming to church every Sabbath and they were dropping a few coins in his cup. Boom. He'd come to church more than everybody else did. He came every day. Everybody else just came on Saturday mostly. But they came and dropped a few. Religion just supported his routine. Now what am I trying to say? I'm not anti-religion. Real religion is taking care of widows and orphans. But listen, just being religious ain't going to get you in. Religion, oh, he would have gotten the medal for attending Sunday school for every day of the year for four, above 40 years. He was the most faithful member that they had. He had come, if religion would have done it, he'd have done it heal because he'd come every day and he stayed all day long at the house of God. All religion done was support the routine. I wonder how many people, God help me, I wonder how many people that's in a routine that the church, the religious church, has just supported it all these years. We want to make sure we put something in his cup because we don't want him to go to another church. But all we're doing is supporting his routine. There's so many of our youngins. There's so many of our youngins that ain't getting saved. I guarantee you, I ask this question all over this country. Who's got a lost son, daughter, grandson, granddaughter, husband, wife, brother, sister, mom, or daddy that's lost? And just about everybody in the building will raise their hand. We've gotten a routine. We're faithful in church, but our youngins ain't getting saved. And we're coming because it's the religious thing to do. There ain't nothing wrong with religion. There's some things you need to do religiously. I went to, we, we had to buy some new insurance whenever we, we quit pastoring and started evangelizing. We had to get some different insurance. And this insurance I got now has got a dental thing to it. I ain't never had dental insurance. And so they, they'll, they'll, they'll clean my teeth every six months. They get me up there to the dentist and they clean my teeth. First time I went up there, that dentist looked at me and started cleaning my teeth. And they said, how old are you? I said, I'm fit, I'm fit, I'm above 40. I said, you ain't got a cavity in your head. You got one of those spot there. I said, yeah, when I was six, I woke up with a cavity. They put that in there, my tooth there. So you ain't got no, where you been going to the dentist? And I said, I ain't, this is my first time ever being in this dentist chair. My first time. They said, you ain't never been to the dentist? I said, no, ma'am, I ain't never been to the dentist. That's why my teeth are healthy. I ain't let y'all scrape all the good stuff off of them. Amen, amen. But hear me, hear me, hear me. She said, what, what do you do? I said, I brush my teeth every morning and every night, and I brush them hard. Can somebody help me? Amen. But what am I saying? You need to brush your teeth religiously. I take a bath every morning if I need one or not, religiously. 
religiously. Y'all look at me. I eat every time it's time religiously. There's some things you got to do religiously to live. Are you with me? But religion ain't getting the job done. Am I making sense? Religion ain't changing people's routine. They're coming hooked on drugs and they're leaving hooked on drugs. They can come to church till the cows come home. Unless there's something happen besides religion, it ain't going to change them none. But then, uh-oh, uh-oh, this guy's in a routine. Religion just supported the routine. But now, here comes Peter and John. Peter and John, what do they represent? Relationship. Holy cow. Why Peter and John? Why not Bartholomew and Matthew? Peter and John. Because Peter and John will go a little farther with him in the garden. Peter and John, John was the only one at the cross. Peter was on the way till he got scared. Peter and John was the first two. Oh, they were the first two at the tomb. Peter, Peter was the one that jumped out the boat and made a thud instead of a splash. They had a relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you still with me? So here it comes. He was in a routine. Religion couldn't help him, but look up the road. There comes Peter and John. They're in relationship. Come here, J.D., Brother J.D., Pastor J.D., come up here just a quick, right here, right quick. Here comes Peter and John. They're in relationship with Jesus Christ. They walk up to him, and they look at him, and oh my God, they said, look on us, and the guy turned and looked at them, expecting to receive something. They said, silver and gold, have I none? I've got something more than the gold that I can shake in my pocket. I'm going to give you something I got. I got a relationship with Jesus Christ. And they took him by the right hand and immediately he got oh, he got up. Immediately the strength came. A relationship done something that religion couldn't do. It broke up the routine. Yes, it did. I got one more quick point. He went running. Come on, come on. Come on, come with me. I can't run far now. I'm fat. He went running. He went running through the place. He went running. He went running. And you know what happened? All the people looked at him and wondered. Now notice he was in a routine. Religion couldn't fix it. Relationship did. And now revival is happening in the church because they were all filled with wonder at what happened to the man. I don't know about you. You could be seated. I don't know about you. But I'm ready for revival. I ain't talking about just a series of meetings. I ain't talking about something, a George Moxley or a Tim Hill or a Bill Lee or whoever can bring. Uh-uh. I'm talking about a revival of relationship that people can give what they got and break people's routines. And we can see that man's expectation was forever changed. He was expecting what religion could give him. I hope a lot of people come to church this morning. I hope they'll come. Maybe they'll put a little extra in my cup this morning. If we can just get a few of them where. But no, when relationship showed up, everything changed. Now tonight, I hope I've made sense. Have I made sense? I hope I've made sense. Tonight, if, I'm, if I've preached this right, and I hope I have, I, I pray that we will come to the altar with expectations tonight, not because we're Church of God, not because we're Pentecostal, not because we're a member of whatever church. All that's good, but that's religion. Are you with me? I hope we come not just out of routine. Come the altar just because the preacher said, uh-uh. I hope we come expecting because of the relationship that we got with him. And if we'll come to the altar with expectation because of our relationship. Now, something bothered me, Pastor J. Nan, about this story. Because hear me. Notice when Peter and John walked up to the guy and, and they looked at him, they, they didn't, they never prayed. That, that but they never prayed. Oh, we would have had him on a prayer list for six months. That's what religion done. 
But he never prayed. He never spoke to God. He spoke to the situation. He spoke to the man. Such as I have, I give unto thee. In the name of Jesus, get up. He never prayed. He didn't call a prayer chain. He didn't call a prayer line. He didn't call everybody on a 21-day Daniel fast. He just looked at that guy and he spoke to the guy. Spoke to the situation. You're a cripple? Hey, I ain't got no money. Ain't gonna help you no way. How much money you got over the last 40 years? But such as I have, I'm gonna give unto thee. I got a relationship with one. He's, oh, oh. I got a relationship with one. He's my healer. I got a relationship with one. He's my redeemer. I got a relationship with one. If he tells you to, you can walk on water. I got a relationship with one. Oh, they hung on a cross, but he got up in three days. I got a relationship with the Alpha and Omega. I got a relationship with the wheel and the center of the wheel. I got a relationship with the lion tamer. I got a relationship with the water walker, the storm calmer. I got a relationship with counselor, wonderful, mighty God. I got a relationship with the one that was dead, yet he lives and he's alive forevermore. I got a relationship with the key holder. I got a relationship with the king of kings and the Lord of lords. I got a relationship with the one that's preparing a place for me. And if he's preparing a place for me, he's going to come again and get me and receive me so that where he is, I'll be also. I got a relationship with the Savior. I got a relationship with Emmanuel. I got a relationship with the healer. I got a relationship with the Holy Ghost baptizer. I got a relationship with the one that's above all others. I got a relationship with the God of all gods and the oh my God help me say it his name is Jesus and I got a relationship with him he's my big brother he's a friend that'll stick closer to me than a brother he is living inside of me he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own if we can take that we can change the routines that our nation has worked herself into. It's got to start with us. Am I making sense? And then revival. He jumped up and started. When's the last time we seen somebody leaping and walking and running in the church? Oh. Whew. When they saw him, they wondered were filled with wonder and amazement. Would you stand with me all over this house? I don't know how you want to do it, Pastor J.D., but if you want to get singers, it's okay. If you don't want to get singers, it's okay. If you want me to sing, that might not be okay. But hey, I don't, I don't care what you do. It don't matter. Tonight, I hope, I hope, I was riding down the road the other day and I was thinking about lost people and the Holy Spirit just filled my truck. I said, the only thing worse, I said, God, there ain't nothing worse than being lost. And then that Spirit is just, just in my truck right there with me. He says, yeah, there's one thing worse than being lost. That's being lost and nobody's looking for you. That's worse than being lost. And I said, God, Help us to have the kind of relationship that we'll start finding the lost and giving them such as we have. We give unto thee. Let's break this routine. Let's break this routine. These people that are homosexuals, they don't want to be homosexuals. They may march and do all the stuff that we see on television. The average lifespan of a homosexual ain't but 40 years. 40 years. Number one killer is AIDS. Number two killer of homosexual suicide. Why suicide? They don't want to be a homosexual. They're just in a routine. They're just in a routine and they're mad at the church because we point our fingers at them. And, 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 and religion actually in an indirect way supported the routine. What would happen if we had such a relationship with Jesus? 
we could speak to that homosexual and say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, be delivered. I don't believe he can help deliver a homosexual. Well, you don't read your Bible. Because he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, such were some of you, but you've been washed, but you've been sanctified, but you've been justified. He's talking about that verse prior, effeminate, that's homosexuality. So what am I saying? What would happen tonight? If we, this altar calls reserved tonight. I, we don't usually do this in church. I, 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 Brother J. Dan, the other day, my, my state, my state, my, my, my governor, Brother Kemp, he passed, he signed a bill. If a baby has got a heartbeat, it's illegal to have an abortion. And, and, and I got, I got, and then some of these actors from Hollywood has boycotted Georgia. Boycotted Georgia. The head of Disney come down and said, we're boycotting Georgia. I wanted to get up, I wanted to drive to Atlanta and get up and say, hey, we've, we've just changed the rules. You're not allowed to come into Georgia. You, you, you're not allowed to come. We just ain't going to let you come in Georgia. You stay out. Are you with me? And, and this altar call tonight is kind of that bold. If you're not expecting anything to happen, don't come to this altar tonight. This ain't for you. <laughs> if you're sitting back there and say, well, I, I don't expect anything. Well, hey, just stay out from this area. Amen. Just sit there a little while while we pray. You can ease out, get up and ease out, and nobody even know you're gone. But, but if you're not expecting anything, don't come to the altar. Don't come to the altar. Just don't come. Come back, come back next week. Come back. When's your next service? Wednesday. Come back. And pay your tithe and all that good stuff. But don't come to the altar if you're not expecting nothing to happen. But if you're expecting something to happen, if you're expecting something to happen, you don't understand. My son ain't here tonight. Let me tell you something. Ernest Holmes. I tell this story a lot of places. I've probably told it here before. Ernest Holmes. I was building the Lighthouse Church of God in St. Mary's, Georgia. Ernest Holmes. I'd won his wife to the Lord. Her name's Viola. Wonderful woman of God. Wonderful woman of God. Owns a flower shop down there. Oh, just a wonderful lady. Ernest come. I was getting ready to pour the, the, the parking lot and cement. Ernest come, give me a price on it. And I was going to use him because Viola is faithful in the church. And this is, this is what happened. Ernest got saved during that process. And he got up and this is his testimony. I was going down to the pub. That's what they called a bar down there. Getting drunk every day after work. He was a cement man. I was going there getting drunk every day. Viola put it in her mind that I was going to stop. So every time I'd leave the house and go to the bar, Viola called a prayer meeting with some of the ladies in this church and meet down this altar and pray. God don't let him get drunk. And he said, I'd go down there and drink. I'd, I'd spend money getting drunk. And I'd drink, I'd drink, 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 and leave sober as a saint. No matter how much I drank, I couldn't get drunk. He said, I got so mad because I knew Viola was down there praying. And he said, I come to this church knowing that y'all like Viola, and I was going to rip y'all off for about $10,000. Then he stood up and he said, he gave his life to Jesus that morning. He said, I'm donating this parking lot because I got to know the God that won't let me get drunk because my wife's down here praying for me. Now, you might not believe that. You know why you don't believe that? Because you don't expect it. Are you with me? Amen. But hear me, hear me. If he can keep Ernest Holmes from getting drunk, when he spent, he said, I was wasting my money buying liquor and not able to get drunk. If he can keep Ernest Holmes from getting drunk, he can touch your son or your daughter wherever he might be tonight. Amen. He can put a hedge around about him. Am I making sense? He can give his angels charge to go around him lest they dash their foot against a stone. God, let's just say, well, that could never happen. No, we don't expect it to happen. What if we expect God to protect our son, our daughter, our husband, our wife until until we can get them to a place of deliverance. Father, Brother J.D. is going to lead us in a song. And God, we're just going to worship you because nothing can happen without your presence. And your presence always abides where there's praise. 
So, Father, we got to praise you for just a moment. But tonight, our praise has got an extra boost of expectation. I love this church. This is a great church. There's no limit. God, when we get to heaven, I want to see. I want to see the record of what this church has. has, has, has. I want to see the record of the souls, God, that's, that's in heaven because of this church and the way they've given and the way they've done through missions and the way they've done here in Garner. But God, God, this church, this church, like all the church, God, we need, we need a move of God like never before. In this day that we're living in, and God, if it's going to be up to uh, the power that's within us, and if that power within us is expectation, then build our expectation tonight. God, I believe we'll praise you harder if we're expecting you to show up when we praise. I believe, God, we'd give greater if we're expecting you to do with that gift what you say you will. God, let us just believe your word tonight and expect it to come to pass. Would you right now with expectation, would you just lift your hands up toward heaven? As, as Pastor J.D. leads us in this song, will you just give him expected pra expectation praise? Because you're expecting Jesus to show up if you're praising. Lead us, brother. Lead us, Pastor. Lead us, Pastor. Lead us, Pastor. As I come into your presence, past the gates of praise, into your sanctuary, till we're standing face to face. I look upon your countenance, I see the fullness of your grace. I can only bow down and say, Expectation! 